Good. Welcome back, everybody, to part two of Am I a Lesser Jew? Meaning, or am I as Jewish as you are? We're discussing here the concept of conservative reform movements versus Orthodox Jewry, etc. We're joined Rabbi Orlovsky, Rav Gav, and Rabbi Yitzchak Feldheim here. Rabbi Feldheim, I'm going to jump right into this question because uh, as the coronavirus hit, this is going to, uh, this became a very thorny topic. But Orthodox Judaism seems to rely very much on their rabbis, right? And to the outside world, and maybe even to the movements of conservative and reform, it seems that these rabbis have our quote, with all respect, a bunch of old men. How, how can we, Orthodox Judaism be taken seriously when there's this concept of listening to, you know, the, the elders, the elders of the generation or the, the Torah scholars of the generation with things that seem to be so modern and so, uh, you know, take dating, for example. Like, why should Orthodox Jews be bound to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the thought process and to the uh, opinions of some old rabbis? And, you know, more recently with the coronavirus, et cetera, explained to us why Orthodox Judaism's view on listening to their, their elders and their Torah scholars is being a um, focal point of, of Orthodox Jewry. Okay, so I, I'm, I guess I, I already spoke a little bit to the point of the authority of our elders, right? That, that, the last you did. Second. You mentioned you mentioned you mentioned Rav Shach, but you mentioned it in, in, in really in 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 the in the from the angle of arguing out points in terms of in terms of that's how we get to the truth of things, and that the people on top are the people who know the most. But how does that relate to modern things that aren't over study that are mundane things that we live our lives with? So, so once it's clear, the first point that that we're not fel- following elders some, by some magical authority, but because we see them as honest and, and insightful and knowledgeable, so, so most of it should be clear. I, I'll follow the niche part, like the, the other side of your question is how smart as they are and as wise as they are, how do they? they are like what do they know about modern phenomena uh, is that like like from the from the side of, of- i mean i mean Rabbi felt on a, on a very practical level a 21 year old boy from a fine yeshiva is dating a 18 year old girl from a uh you know a nice jewish you know religious seminary and she will go to a 90 year old rabbi to ask his opinion on marrying this 21 year old boy i mean People from the outside must be looking in and saying, like, for real? Right. So, so again, so I'll, I'll add one thing. There's two points. There's the one is the authority of the person. There's not, number one is, I think, what you're concerned about is, like, how is smart and as wise as they are? How can touch can they be with the modern world? So, that, so let me just add. I spoke about the wisdom of... Right. Of the- one and, and what prompts that 18-year-old girl to go ask his opinion? Right. I mean, why does she assume that he has anything to say about? Right. So, so I want to add to the intellectual skill prowess of the rabbi. It's also an unbelievable love for you. We don't choose rabbis just because they're smart. They have to be wonderful people. If a person has poor character, he's not going to make it there. So we're talking about going to a person who's loving and concerned and also very smart. But the other side of it is as loving and as wise as he is, who says he has anything to say about the world today? So, so let, let, me, let, let me give you a classic example. Of, 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 I think it's very useful today of where this, where this came up before. Um, there's one, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses spent his entire life defending the Jewish people from sins. God is constantly through the Torah, I want to wipe them out. And Moshe's going, no, 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 save them. And that's the whole Torah, except one instance. Korach leads a rebellion, and Moshe, and, and, and Moshe says to Hashem, I want this guy to die like no one ever died before. The ground's got to open up and swallow him up. It's like the most out-of-character thing in the entire world, and it makes no sense. And you, but you know what happens? The, everyone's on Korach's side. Everyone gathers around Korach. All the young generation is saying, wow, he's so... Korach is saying, why do we need leaders? Let's all be the same, you know? Well, 
you know, just defund the police. Everyone should be, uh, we don't need, a, why are you making, Moshe's making Kohanim and Leviim. Why are you making Kohens and Levies? Let everyone be equal. Why can't we all be friends and get along? And that's what's been going on for generations. People talk like that. The youth are always, you know, hippies and, 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 and you know, they're, 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 they're chill. They're going, oh, the, 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 our parents are squares. Our parents are untouched. Our parents are bourgeois. Our parents are concerned about money and they're cold. The modern world is more loving, more progressive, more forgiving, more, less prejudiced. This is the eternal thing. Why should we listen to old fashioned people? And most specifically in their, in their coarseness, their, their, un, their, 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 their regressiveness. So, most this is the classic case is Moshe gets up and says Korach's wrong and everyone says Korach's the greatest. Korach says, well, you know, everyone's great. Moshe, why are you making yourself bigger? And, and what happens is, is everyone fights at Moshe. Korach ends up dying and they're still angry at Moshe. Do you think he's out of touch? So wh why do we listen to Moshe? What changed? They realized one thing. Everyone in the crowd heard Moshe, heard Korach saying, everyone's equal. Let's all be friends. Why are you Kohens and Levies? Why are you making yourself higher? Everyone heard this and they turned to Mush. We all go through this utopian communist stage where we think, wouldn't it be nice a world without competition? Everyone goes through this. The Moshe, this is the line in the sand. Why? What did Moshe see that we didn't? One subtle little line. Moshe says, the, Korach says, let, why do you need Kohens and ladies? Everyone should be equal. Why are you making yourself higher? If someone is truly loving, you know, if someone's truly loving, what do they do? What do they, what would Korach advocate? If you're giving out positions to people and Korach is, <laughs> I got to keep a straight face over here. You guys are crazy. <clears throat> I love it. Anyways. Are we old fashioned bigger clowns and kids are over here? You know, like uh, this is this is the answer to the question. Um, okay, a bunch of rebellious kids as rabbis. So we, we bridge both worlds. Let, let me just get to the point because it sounds like I'm not even talking to the thing, but the punchline will make it clear. The punchline is, is why does everyone turn to mush? Because Korach is saying, let everyone be equal. Why? So, but let's see what the wise old man understands is that every generation people want to get rid of responsibility. Everyone, everyone has a, a, we have fears and insecurities and therefore we want to chill. We look for easy paths. The wisdom of ages is to see our greatness and to understand all the ways that people run away from responsibility. The rabbi comes in. I felt I'm, I felt that we stopped hearing you well. Really? Am I, now, am I good now? Yeah. Now you're right. Okay, I don't know. All right. Um, you thought we were. You thought we weren't listening. Yeah, I know. I think. I think the <laughs> this valley is trying to step on my ideas. You know, they're yeah. uh, right. So, so uh, we, so we we're looking for the easy way out. We're not looking for responsibility. Yeah. Korach says the following: Kola Everyone's holy. If Korach was really sincere, he would have said, "Give everyone a position. Everyone's going to ladies. Give everyone a position." What Korach says is one line that no one else saw. Korach says, everyone's holy. Why are you higher? What is the difference? If you're, cons there's two ways to create love and equality. One way is, is to pick everybody up. And the other way is to knock everybody down. Everyone's drawn to these movements of hippies and stuff because it sounds so loving. And it is possibly. What our leaders understand is that the goal of life is to make you great. And people are always trying to run away and make their life easier. And they have great ideas. And if you listen to their ideas, everyone fawns over the philosophies of people who want to make my job easier and say that there's no values and no purpose. And, and someone has to come there and understand, I heard this for 500 years already. This is what, and only, if, if Moshe wouldn't have been there, everyone would have gathered with Korach, taken to the streets, and gotten rid of all authority. They would have gotten rid of grades on tests. They would have gotten rid of paychecks based on how much work you do. They would have based, gotten rid of marriage, everything that takes work and structure. And Moshe got up and says, no, Korach's a faker. He doesn't want to pick anyone up. He wants to knock everyone down. The, to me, the hallmark of Jewish leadership is this role of Moshe.
He's the, he's the lifeguard on the pool, watching the kids doing dangerous things. And we're here standing today because it, it's so easy to make the cop-out sound glorified and even easier to make the people who are working hard sound like evil, selfish, arrogant people. They, they think they know what's right. There's a, there's, the world loves haziness and fogginess and the, our leaders are the models of discipline and greatness. There's, there's peace, tranquility, easy chilling, and then the standing on top of the mountain of accomplishment. And that's what we understand as our leaders are. I go to my rabbi to ask him, Rabbi, which of my two voice, I have this choice, which is the cop out? Am I lying to myself? Which is, which, which, is, which is my dreams talking and which is my fears talking? And since Moshe, that is the hallmark of Jewish leadership. The, the, the guardians of dreams, and they can smell, they can, my rebellion can smell my excuses, my cop-outs. And they go, yeah, it's so cute you're saying that, but you know the truth. You know, you see the rabbi doesn't even have to answer you. He looks at you and he smiles and he shakes his head and that way you go like, no. <laughs> you know, you go, Amazing. Amazing concept. Because they know they know really what we want to strive to be and what's best for us. And we it's unadulterated. Dreams and fears have never changed. It's just the way we spin our fears. Nobody says I'm a coward. They say, oh, arrogant dreamers. They say elitist. I'm going to go to the hard yeshiva. They're just a bunch of show-offs. And Rabbi will know if, if, it, if, that's, if it's within your abilities and you should go there and it's just you're, you're scared. And this girl, I'm dating this girl. I, when I was dating, you know, you're dating, you, you always want to marry a girl who's a little more chill so that you don't have to go to Shachar so early, you know? And the rap, I, I would come, I would go like, you know what, she doesn't listen to secular music. What is that? What's that a catch word for a yeshiva guy? It means I want a little wiggle room. A girl who's like, religious i'm gonna have to like be a really good guy you know i want so the rabbi would listen and go kids like yeah yeah it's about secular music right that's what it's about you oh it's very or it's, is it about that that girl was too regal for you and too 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 pure and too holy you wouldn't you felt a little pressured and until then i learned that every guy who comes to me i listen to him and i wait to hear his justification for copying yeah. and i call him out and that's that I, thank you Robert, Robert Lasky, hold on. i want to go to you for Misconcep misconceptions or conceptions that people have about Orthodox Judaism. Rabbi Gav, you have a final comment on this concept of going to rabbis and asking them their opinions? Yo, yo, absolutely. I, I just want to share two points. One is the first. It's a funny question if you think about it. You, you go to a person who's a scientist and you know the guy's been a scientist for 50 or 60 years and is still a scientist and he's still working on it and he's still learning and he's still growing you say, why should we go to that guy? Let's go to someone younger with less experience who's never learned about the past or even now. It doesn't make any sense. I never heard anyone complain that Dr. Fauci is too old to go to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So when Except you're President Trump. No, no, he goes to him. He goes to Fauci. He says, I know, I know. Up sometimes, but you know, but I respect the man because he has many years of experience. Right, right. That's right. Experience is uh, Lamaisa being. And, and to your and to your point, Rabbi Lasky, that people don't change circumstances, might, but people are the same, and so what you knew then affects people the same way. Being being that I'm the youngest and wisest on the panel with the most experience, I'd like to just point out that. Listen, the Mitzvah. The reality is, as I sit here and I listen to the different answers over the 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 these little question answers we've had. And I've had the privilege of sitting with all three of these great, great people in, in different countries and different places. I love to listen. Like Robert Lofsky called me up the first question and answer. Oh, you like to go last. Huh? You hear all the good answers and you just repeat them, right? <laughs> the answer is yes. That is what I like to do. So why do we go to the ones that are older? The answer is because they know more. Like, what, what does that mean? So that's, that's one on a very straightforward, that you can't, what are you going to argue? There's another level, though, which takes us back to our mantra, to our theme, to our to our everything. We our theme song we've been singing the whole time, and that is that. You know, I think it's I think it's it's a, a shweki song that they made into a mishnah, and that's hafachba hafachba the kula ba ben bagbag ben bagbag omer. Apparently, said it twice, and that's what the mishnah says in chapter five, mishnah twenty three, four, five, somewhere at the end. That says that that. If you turn it and you turn it 
everything is in it. You know why we go to the rabbis that are older? The answer is precisely because of how much time and effort and energy, experience, and knowledge of truth they have. You'd be astounded. For those who are not familiar, like Rabbi Feller mentioned before, all the books by Andrew Berlavsky, or if they're real or not, but all the books by Andrew Berlavsky, like just like this new house I moved into, all, all these all these books about Shilas and Chuvas, which are basically question and answer response. You go through one of the classics of Moshe Feinstein. Moshe Feinstein, a blessed memory, passed away in 1986, was considered the, the rabbi of, of Judaism. Right? <laughs> you pull it out. Oh, there it is, Igor Moshe. And he, he wrote a series of, of, of response, of, of questions and answers. They span questions from what do you have to wear a kippah to are you allowed to smoke marijuana? They, they, they go from like make kotza el kotza, and you say, well, what does he know about that? The answer is everything is in the Torah. So you want to know why we go to these people simply logically because of the fact, and we ready to get understand, simply because of the fact that, that number one, just logically, they know, they have the experience and they have the knowledge. They've been through the maze. They've seen the mistakes and they can at least tell you, listen, I might not know what right road to go on, but don't go on that one because I made a mistake on that one, right? They can at least tell you that. And number two, that's the Torah. The Torah is Emes. Moshe Emes, the Torah is Emes. The Torah, the, the Bible, this book we have is the truth coming from God. One who learns it will get understanding that even presidents of the United States, time and time again, have written to great rabbis to ask their opinion. And those rabbis, average age, <laughs> were 70 to 80 years old because they had that experience and that knowledge. So that's why we go as a 19-year-old girl. When I was a 19-year-old girl, that's why I used to go to these rabbis to ask them these questions. Got it. By the way, that answers a lot of things. Right? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Rob, Robert? I have one story because on this point, you sure. know, the rabbi is not there to tell you if the chicken is kosher. He's not there to make you a bar mitzvah. That's not what the rabbi is there for. The Torah covers every aspect of life. So my father went to ask a Shiloh to the square rabbi. He was dying of lung cancer. And the chemotherapy was terrible. Terrible. We're waiting in line. And this person is coming to ask the rabbi about a shidduch. And this person is coming to ask the rabbi about a business deal. And this person, everybody's asking different questions because Judaism covers every aspect of it. So my father gets there and he's, Start speaking in Yiddish. And, and the Rebbe says, it's okay, you can speak in English. So he says, I'm in chemotherapy, but I heard about this virus treatment in Hungary. And, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, I heard it successful. Blah, 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 I get the whole thing. So the Rebbe looks at him. The Rebbe, you know, he goes, I want to see three sets of x-rays before and after. Show me what the cancer looked like before the virus treatment and afterwards. He says, fuck it. If you can show me that there's a treatment that's more effective than chemotherapy, I'll advise this to people. But to the best of my medical information that I have asked doctors, there is nothing that works besides this. So my father said, so I have to continue with the chemotherapy? He says, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's the only thing that has been medically proven. Because if you're a rabbi, and keep your life and, and guard your health, that's a mitzvah in the Torah. So when someone comes to you and asks about a medical procedure, you have to know. You have to be talking to doctors and to scientists. When a question comes up about, like people mentioned Shabbos claps or any technology, you have to know what you're talking about. When someone comes in about uh, you know, in vitro fertilization or, uh, or uh, uh, a, a gene therapy or any other thing, you have to know because Jew Judaism carries uh, effects on every aspect of life. Well, it's not only that you need to know, you need to know and figure out how that follows Jewish law. Of course. So that's why a person who's an expert in Jewish law can look at it and tell you, this is what the Torah will prescribe and this is what it won't. Right. Let me add okay. one, it hit me as everyone's talking that, that, you know, most people listening to this, they have a different picture of a rabbi. Echo what they're saying, because their picture. The picture of a rabbi is what is is a guy who who is trained in public speaking and rhetoric and fundraising and politics. That's not our rabbis. We're talking about a whole right. different thing. Just the opposite, right? They they don't do, they didn't do any of that. They said it's not me. I'm not the rabbi. Someone comes to me with an important question. 
I'm going to my Rebbe. I'm not answering it. I'll say, hold on. I'll get back to you. None of us are. When we say rabbi, we're talking about a person who, who is surrounded by wisdom and he has avoided all. He hasn't done anything in his life that made him feel ashamed or guilty that will color his clear clarity of thought. He lives a pure life. He's not going to movies. He's not dancing at parties. Everyone is kind of... We're, we're, we're going to get to all of that. We're going to get to all well, of that. These which are... rabbi do you know that did that, Rabbi? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Rabbi Orlowski, there's a, there's a conception, there's a maybe a misconception um, that people looking into Orthodox Judaism are asking. It's a little bit sharp and pointed, but here, here it goes. The question was stated by one person, three different questions here. It's why does everyone know an Orthodox Jew or more than one who cheats in business, right? If you're religious, why would you cheat? You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're, you're, you mean your religion is only in the synagogue, only for show, right? I'm sure Robert Feldman, you've had this in your debates, etc. right? I um, think this question, my answer to these kind of questions. One time, one time, let me get, let me get, I have to finish B of this, B of this. Let's see a line, but go ahead. I was told it's okay for Orthodox Jews to cheat anyone that's not Orthodox, even other Jews, and especially non-Jews, including the government. Is that why many Orthodox Jews are cheating the government with food stamps, welfare, etc.? My response to this is, I'll give a answer. I'm thinking a one-liner, is that... We were just, so cool that you asked that. We were just discussing that by our meeting of the elders of Zion. While we were sipping on the blood of Christian babies, thinking about how to educate our sons who were born through holes and sheets. You, you, you're asking questions, every anti-Semitic canard in the world. It's ridiculous. We're the most moral people in the world. You're gonna go cherry picking a bunch of creeps. Everybody's got their creeps, okay? This is this is not what we value. It's like the, the guy asked the question deserves a smack. Okay, I know. Right. I'm on email. <laughs> you should have an email smack response. Okay. I'll have I'll have him email you. But I just want to, on this point, Rabbi Lasky, and give this over to you. But I, I actually, a friend of mine was driving. This is, it goes back twenty years. But a friend of mine was driving. It was before Shabbos. He was in Lakewood, New Jersey. He was in a rush, and he's flying down Clifton Avenue. Okay, and a cop pulls him over for speeding, and he's so upset. He says to the cop, like, you know I'm in a rush. You know it's before Shabbos. Like, now you got to pull me over and give me a ticket? The cop looked at him and he said, listen, I've been a cop in this neighborhood for a long time. I'm not getting you on murders. I'm not getting you on rapes. I'm going to give you a ticket on Clifton Avenue on Friday afternoon. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Robert Orlovsky, your thoughts on people asking this question about Orthodox Jews? There's, a, there's an old rule in journalism. Yeah. Dog bites man, not news. Man bites dog, that's news. You'll never see a headline that says, secular Jew arrested for stealing. <laughs> Atheist commits rape. <laughs> because you assume that. That goes without saying that if someone's doing a crime, you assume because they're not religious. Yeah? So in the, every time they find a religious guy, oh, oh, that's a story. We put him on the front page. We take a big picture, you know, make a, have, him, have him put this yarmulke in front of his face. You know what I mean? Because it's so rare. It's the exception. Now, how do you justify it? Like this. Somebody has to tell the Rosh Hashiva. How do you explain non from Jew? How do you find from Jews who cheat or steal or lie? So it's the same way I explain from Jews who don't keep Shabbos and eat not kosher. They're not from, you understand? So if I tell you, you see, this is great. I, I love how these questions are all so self-contradicting me. Judaism is robotic. They listen to everything the rabbis say. They have no choice. How come they go out and steal and go, I don't know who it's the rabbis. The answer is because there are people who don't listen and people decide to do the wrong thing. Everybody, um, uh, there's, there's always people who are going to be imperfect in a system. No system is going to be 100%. The best you can do is to try to set up a, a, a station. So a Hasidic story. Can I tell a Hasidic story? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I told him, a Polish, I don't do so good with it. But oh, yeah, yeah. It was Rebbe Yitzchik Badichev. Rebbe Yitzchik Badichev. Yom Kippur night. 
he would always find some outstanding act that a Jew did. And he would be the defense attorney of the Jewish people on Yom Kippur night. And he'd say, God, look at this tremendous act of righteousness. There are many stories of that. And one year I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anything. So he says, God, I haven't got anything to say. You want to kill the Jewish people, kill the Jewish people. I got one question for you. You got anybody better? You got any better? When Israel, at tremendous expense and, and risk and difficulty, brought across the black Jews from Ethiopia, who it was, not everybody agreed. They were Jewish. They weren't Jewish. They brought them across. You know what the response was from the world? Why'd they only bring the Jews? Nobody said, wow, the Jews took the Jews. The Christians should take the Christians. The Muslims should take the Muslims. No, why don't you take care of everybody? You know? You know, people say to me, why don't uh, Jews give more money to secular causes? I said, who are the secular people giving money to Jewish causes? Nobody cares about us. Nobody takes care of us. So, so you'll find that a religious Jew did something wrong. And then, well, uh, you know. So one last story on this. There's this uh, but guy. The, but, the, but the question is, again, I'll let you finish the story. But I say the question is, do we condone Jews cheating or taking advantage of non-Orthodox Jews or non-Jews altogether, and especially governments. Do we condone that? Of course not. Of course not. A friend of mine, his nephew spell, sends expensive jewels. So he went to Saudi Arabia to sell some jewel because the sheiks buy these expensive Jews, jewels. So he comes in and the guy outside told him, you better take off your yarmulke, you know, if you want to make this sale. I'm not taking off my yarmulke. You know, he comes in and the sheik looks at him and he goes, I'm going to guess you want a glass of water and a paper cup. Am I correct? <laughs> so he says, uh, that would be fine, your majesty. You know, he says, we always used to do business with the Jews. You know, he says, the Englishmen used to rip us off much more. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you we never had a Jew cheat us, but at least they don't cheat us as much as the others. <laughs> like Jackie Mason says, a Jew couldn't be a mugger. A Jew couldn't pull out a gun and say, give me all your money. He'd say, how much you got? Let's work out something. <laughs> but he also he also he also said that a, that a Jew could do much better with a retainer. <laughs> but but it's an amazing story, a true story. This guy breaks down on Route 17 going up to the Catskills. So three cars pull over from people, and the guy's wearing a yarmulke. And they say, How can we help you? They change the tire, then you know, they this. Anyway, after they're all done, they see he's wearing a cross. I said, why are you wearing a cross? He goes, I'm Christian. He says, why are you wearing a yarmulke? He says, what? That thing on your head. He goes, I don't know. When I first started driving, my mother gave me one of these and said, if you ever break down, put one on and people will stop and help you. <laughs> so therefore you can cheat. I missed that. What's the... <laughs> hey, we're, not, we're not perfect. But as Lady Yitzhak said, we're a lot better than anybody else who's out there. We're doing better than anybody else. And okay, I want... That's, that was a Newsweek op-ed article once, I remember, during the first intifada where they said, yes, we're holding Israel to a higher standard. We expect them to. They're God's chosen people. This was a, a, an editorial in Newsweek. Today, that would be racist. Uh, okay, I, I want to move, move on to, um, unless, Robert Feldman, you commented. We have you have any final comments on this before I move on. I have two more concepts and then a final question. Um, that I want to ask. And, and do you want to add anything to this? I just I just want to echo the words I heard from Robert Olavsky many years ago. Don't defend the undefendable, which is essentially what he said. If something is wrong, it's wrong. And people do things that are wrong. So they say like, oh, and therefore you see there's a Jew that does it. Okay, so they did the wrong thing. And we move on with life. You know, not, not okay. We have to work on it. But I'll add, don't, don't defend it. You, you, you can't let people ask these questions and get away with it. it it's self, we have enough self-hating Jews. It's obvious. Nobody, nobody believes that we condone it. It's just a way to like wipe the smile off the religious guy. So don't, don't, don't play that game. Don't fall prey. Okay. Um, further con conceptions, misconceptions that people have um, is is and and this this is actually probably more reality. But I'm going to leave this to you. I'm going to start with. You are if held if you don't mind. The Orthodox Jews seem to shun technology and not be involved in TVs and movies and secular music, etc. Right? So why do religious Jews 
either avoid or limit the use of new technology, new technologies that are revolutionizing the world, like smartphones and shut out the social media technology. Why is it even an issue? Why don't basically why don't Orthodox Jews just go with the flow, man? Come on, meaning stay with the times, go with the flow, right? Isn't isn't that isn't that a better idea than shunning all this stuff out? Just to shorten the, the questions that are basically coming in here. Right. Okay. No, that's that's important. That's very, this is the most important questions. You know, I I I my whole career was going to colleges and talking to kids, and my 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 appeal was that I was normal. I wasn't the rabbi in a you know in a long black coat, and the kids were willing to hear me because I came across normal. My whole career was basically almost derailed when they had that that. Uh, gathering in big field against the internet, you know, the, so every college I went to, the kids were like, oh, you're like one of them, you're like the Taliban, you're like bin Laden, you know, it was, uh, it, it almost ruined everything. Uh, um, but how do we explain this? We come across, we talk about being open-minded and being thinkers. So if you're thinkers, what are you scared of? A thinker shouldn't be scared. Information is not, uh, not damaging. So this is really the question is, is we are on defensive. And it's a similar way. I just did. It's, it's a little different, but my, uh, it's the same point in a metaphor. I I was asked to do an op-ed in Lakewood. We have a big problem with anti-Semitism in, in the surround because we're really thriving and we're growing. So the surrounding towns, uh, those who follow the news, a lot of anti-Semitism. And there's a newspaper in the area, the Asbury Park Press, which was really the the hotbed of the anti-Semitism. They they're trying to do some kind of tshuva, and they opened up their paper to to the Orthodox community. To, they said we want an op-ed. Can someone, so I provided them an op-ed about, uh, and here's what I wrote. And this, my, the answer for this will be similar to what I would tell you for this. It's just, an, it's easy, sometimes easier to hear the point in a separate arena and bring it over to this arena. I said, there's a lot of causes for anti-Semitism. Most of them don't deserve a response, but there is one cause of anti-Semitism that deserves a response from us, because I think it's legitimate. And that is that some people love America they fought for America, they value American values, and they see communities that are insular as an insult for everything that they think is beautiful. Insularity is inherently an insult to the prevailing culture. So the fact that we Orthodox Jews keep to ourselves, we're really insulting them by saying, your, your culture's poison. And, and they love their culture. So they, those people who are angry at us for rejection of what they see as beautiful, those people deserve a response. It's not the majority of anti-Semites, but it's a legitimate. And my response to them is, is we're not rejecting your culture. We love American culture. Most of American culture was built on Judeo-Christian values, which is really Judeo values, not Christian values. So it's our stuff. We're on the same page. The founding fathers were rooted everything in the Torah. Why do we pull away from secular culture today? Because secular culture is no longer American. The, the, the forces that have taken over the world are, are voices that want to shame everything we value. They make you feel guilty for caring about marriage and children and love and all the things we, we cherish. They run the streets and they run the campuses and they run the media. We're not, pull yes, we are insular, but don't see us as pulling away from American values. We're pulling away from the values that are trying to shame America. We're on your team and we're, you're going to do the same thing we do eventually. You're welcome into our ghettos with us so that your children will be safe to be proud Americans, which they can't be out there. That was my response to them. And it's the same point with this. We're not pulling away from the world. We love the world. The God created this world as a garden. We're supposed to be dancing in here and watching sunsets and smelling flowers and singing songs and learning knowledge and books. The problem is that that is not the dominant voice in the world today. You send your kids to college. They're not having their minds expanded. They're having them drain of everything valuable. And if they don't give in at first, they're going to be shamed and laughed at and taunted. They're not going to hear the voice of scholarship. What they hear is cackling, sneering, and cynicism. We're pulling away from the world. We love, don't ask questions, why don't we love? We love the world. We love science. We love information. There's no knowledge that's bad. The problem is that in the modern world, the vo you, I grew up with television. I learned most of my morality from the Brady Bunch. 
you know, and, and, and Sesame Street, you know. I spent hours by the front of the mirror trying to learn how to talk while I brushed my teeth like they could without drooling out all of the, 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 the toothpaste, you know, like I, I, anyone who watched the Brady Bunch, everything took place in the, in the family bathroom, brushing their teeth, whatever. But we look, well, I a lot of things are clear to me now, Rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not the case anymore. Today, today we need, uh, unfortunately, we have to pull back. The reason why I had, he had the gathering in City Field is not because of all the information on the internet. It's it's because of all the all the inappropriate. Children cannot. You cannot let people be exposed to things that make them feel shamed. When someone feels shamed, they curl up and they 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 become a fraction of themselves. They're, the thing that silences dreams is the feeling that I'm not deserving of them. And what makes people feel not deserving is the dirtiness and the, that comes from our culture. Our culture values also fame and popularity. So you, by exposing your kid to this, you're feeding him a, an assortment of dreams that are how popular are you? How many fans do you have? We're destroying people. I, I pray, we pray for the day that the world will be, be, be be a beautiful place again and we can let our kids run free in the world you know like they do in the bungalow colonies in their, in their pajamas but unfortunately not everything's a safe bungalow colony anymore don't think that we're against the world that's all right Rav Gav on, on this point the 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 concept of studying Torah trumps all of the technology and the modern you know the, the modernized television movies etc because we have to learn Torah pulling back on the stuff and learning Torah. Is there, is there room in Judaism for all of this? Or does Orthodox Judaism basically pulling back because there's only one way to go and that's the studying of the Torah? Well, when you say for all of this, that's a very vague term. It's uh, including a lot of stuff. <laughs> I would say most of it like Rabbi Feldman was saying, everybody should be pulling back from. <laughs> you know, if anyone yeah. still knows what Marsha, Marsha, Marsha means, that's okay. You, you know, that's you're you're okay. You know, with all curls like their mother, or whatever. But uh, but at the at the same time, does that mean that a person can't relax and chill and enjoy themselves? Of course, it doesn't mean that at all. As a matter of fact, it's very much encouraged to do such a thing. And I, let me just make one one point and then. As yeah. for your background, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. I grew up in Rabbi Feldheim's house, and he used to make me watch the show with him. And it was crazy. But really, I didn't grow up in his house, but I am from Long Island. Anyway, so so um, the point, uh, but it was already religious. What could you do? I farm birth. Okay, so, here, so here's the, here's the uh, two points I want to make about that. And then the second one being what you just asked me. The, the, the first one is, there was an article that came out about two years ago. Rabbi Friedman, you may have seen it. And, and there was an article in Israel. There's a concept in Israel, which is an, it's, it's a phenomenal concept that if you don't know what it means, you're going to be thoroughly confused. There's something known as a kosher phone. Now, for those who, uh, who know what kosher is, so then immediately our thoughts go into, ah, it's a phone that you can eat. Like, what, what exactly does that mean? And, and secular Jews who've never heard it are very like, what I, they don't even know what I'm talking about when I say that. A kosher phone is a telephone before the year 2001. It was, it was before, well, really, before 2007. It's, 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 really, it's really a stupid phone, right? It's what they call it's what they call a stupid phone now, right? The, the smartphones and the stupid phones. And the way that my daughters tell me is that those who have stupid phones are smart, and those who have smartphones are stupid. That's the way that the kids these days. But anyway, but here, but here's here's the deal. This this thing called a smart uh, stupid phone or a kosher phone is a phone. It's like the original Nokia's. I'm not going back to some of your age, you know, whatever, when they had the backpacks for phones. I mean, the ones that had like, you know, the Nokia phones with snake on it at most. No even texting, no internet, no nothing. It's a phone. Now, you say like, that's what you have. Oh, come on, what are you doing with the world? Two years ago, there was an article that came out in Israel from secular Israeli parents that wanted to start a movement to take away their kids' smartphones and give them all kosher phones for one simple reason. They found that the entire summer, their kids didn't get out of bed till four o'clock in the afternoon because they slept till one or two. And then from two to four, 
they would they would be on their smartphones. Then they'd go pee. Then they'd go back until dinner, which was really breakfast, and and so on and so forth. So there was a movement in the secular Israeli world to get rid of the smartphones. Why? Embrace. What are you doing? Because they start to see there's a catastrophe going on over here. And I'm not even getting to like Rabbi Feldman mentioned with the the dangers of that everyone knows about, the dangers that lurk in the world out here. I'm not even talking about the danger. It's like, it's like Yitzchok Berkowitz, a rabbi here in Israel, said, uh, 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 he had like a little talk about this topic. And he said, it's like the te- technology here in Israel, right? but he had a talk and he said, forget about, forget about the inappropriate, forget about the dangers. Just take a stopwatch with you. And every time you go on the computer, online, you're surfing, just time yourself. Little does he know there's something called screen time. You don't have to think of stuff. You don't have to think of stopwatch, right? And just see how much time you throw away in your waist. So are we against the concept of, uh, is it only Torah? Sit down and steig and learn. And that's in Torah, Torah, Torah. The answer is, you know what it is? It's growth. It's about being growth oriented. There's two topics. One is called Bittal. Torah, one's called Bittel Zman. One is a nullification of spending time learning Torah. Another is just wasting your time. And it is widely discussed that wasting time is even worse than wasting Torah, even though Torah is paramount. Why? Because fine, you're not going to learn Torah, at least be productive. But you're not even productive? Then as just to quote, I don't know if it's the 80s or 90s, I don't even know who said it, but I think the quote is, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And that's uh, and that's where, where I leave it at that. Sorry, Rabbi Lasky, I have, an, I have another question for you about about dress of the Orthodox community. Do you have any comments on this technology further from, uh, from what these what these rabbis pointed out? Yeah, but don't worry about it. <laughs> I got I got comments about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Lasky, the, the 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 things that the you know conservative reform even non Jews. Uh, comment about Orthodox Jewry is the habits of dress and behavior, right? Why are both men and women, uh, women dressed in such old-fashioned way? Like you stepped out of the 1930s with hats and suits, even when in informal settings and long skirts, long blouses, dresses, etc. Why do the men look like penguins in the black and white? And for goodness sake, why do we wear so much clothing when it's so hot outside, right? Come on, get with the times. Rabbi, your thoughts? For all of human history, people covered their heads. There was only one society in history that did not cover their heads, and that was the Greeks. Everybody else wore a turban. They wore some sort of a hat. They wore some sort of a thing. I'm remembering Les Miserables because, you know, since, of course, I'm, I'm cut off from secular knowledge. So uh, I remember at one point, somebody recognized him when he had been the mayor of the town, and they said, Mayor, what are you doing out here? I'm without a hat, right? In, uh, in The Hobbit, you know, it says he ran out of the house, Bilbo bag, and runs out so quickly, he forgot his hat. It was like, who walked out without a hat? Everybody wore a hat. The first person who didn't wear a hat was John F. Kennedy. And as it turns out, that didn't work out so well for him. But forget about that. The, the point, too soon? Anyway, but the point is that, <laughs> the point is that, you know, this Rabbi idea... by a hat, not a helmet. No, but but what, what happened to him? I'm a little young. What happened to him? Uh, yeah. He became an airport. It's a very sad story. But anyway, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> but he, uh, yeah, he finally took off. Anyway, but um, the, uh, uh, the, the idea of suddenly, we now live in a society where there's no, where there's no uh, respect. So I used to remember when... There used to be signs on restaurants. No one served without a tie. You went out to eat, you got dressed, you put on a suit, you put on a tie, you know? You came in in jeans and t-shirt, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, serve you because there was, a, there was a concept of respect, you know? So now they changed, yeah? No shirts, no shoes, no serving. So now we're happy if you put on a shirt and a, and a patient. And now there was one restaurant that had to take it away because it was considered racist. For reasons yeah. that are unclear to me, this was a right. or, or or no mask. Yeah, well, man, I'm never going to that. I'm thinking about even before that. So, so, uh, so the idea is that there's still a concept of self-respect. So I used to teach in seminary. I had three rules. The girls knew: no talking in class. I told you, once I take attendance, you can go outside. I don't care. 
I, I don't care if you're here or not. But if you're here, don't talk because it's disrupting and it's disrespectful. I said, turn off your cell phone because when the cell phone goes off in class, it's very disruptive. And no gum chewing. And they just couldn't understand that. Well, why can't I chew gum? I said, because the Queen of England doesn't chew gum. Because a bride under the chuppah doesn't chew gum. Because when there's a sense of self-respect, we carry ourselves with self-respect. And to this day, there are very few men who do not feel so much cooler about themselves when they put on a tuxedo. They're walking around, martini, shaken, not stirred. You understand? Like They suddenly feel like caution because when you carry yourself with kashivas. So we Jews, we still have this idea of respect. Respect, you know? I remember, I remember in the old days in Israel, in the Knesset, you know, these old uh, Labor Party people would come into the Knesset with, 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 with shirts and, and shorts. Now everybody wears a tie. Everybody walks in with a suit and a tie because it's respect. Because you understand there's a certain standard that you have to have. So we've never lost that respect. Like I say, just because the world changed doesn't mean that we changed. So, so how come everybody dresses the same? So the, the, the Talmud tells us that black is modest. That's the only reason. It also happens to be slimming, but that's not the real reason. The reason is considered more modest. You know, so people say, you lose your individuality. And I say, I got to tell you, no one ever accused me of losing my individuality. That's, there's a lot of things people say about me, but that I'm an individual? And I'll tell you better than that. If you need clothes to make you an individual, you don't have to worry. You don't have anything going for you anyway. If the best I can say about you is, wow, look at his outfit. Could you imagine you're being set up with a girl? Says, how about her? Oh, she dresses very nicely. Yeah, but what is she dressing? I don't understand. What does that mean? That's the best you can say is that I have clothes? So you say, oh, and I remember I was, I was in a principal's office once. He had an Archie comic from the newspaper on the wall. And a guy comes into Mr. Weatherby, he's the principal, with this like long kind of like leather coat. And he says, why are you wearing that crazy coat? He goes, gives me individuality. And he looks out in the playground and everybody's wearing that coat. He says, I think it needs a little work. <laughs> so if you need clothes to give you a personality and individualism, don't worry, you don't have any anyway. In fact, the best way to achieve independence so that you can be seen as a person is when everyone dresses the same. Because when everyone dresses the same, the only thing that's left is you. Who are you? Not tell me what you're wearing and how you dressed and you know, who are you as a person? Rabbi Feldheim, and any comments on people looking at Orthodox Jews as the falling out of the 1930s, all dressed the same. Come on, get with the times. Yeah, no. So I agree. With Rabbi Lasky said it very nicely. It's uh, it's it's dignity, you know. Uh, a person, uh, a person, it's like um, it's it's self-respect, you know. A person who respects himself conducts yeah. himself. The desire, so is... the desire to, it's 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 one of these things. I used to give a class on dating, on on and mostly philosophy, but at the end I gave a few little pieces, three pieces of advice. So these are my most important pieces of advice. The, the most, one of the, my three most important pieces was don't do casual dates, a casual date. What does that mean? You, 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 you're just starting off the, the dating with already the assumption this is not real, you know? You know, there are college degrees probably with people who specialize in the light, you know, art, art in art degrees for in art museums, part of the art is, is how to frame it and how to do the lighting around the art. You, something is beautiful, you want to put it in the right context. You want to frame it properly. You want people to come to it. I remember I went to the Taj Mahal. The most impressive thing about the Taj Mahal wasn't the Taj Mahal. It was the, the, the scope of the lands and the fields and the turrets leading up to it. You felt the awe of the hugeness of it. It prepped you for the for the last moment when it came into view, because you had to walk through this tunnel and that tunnel and this field and that field from every direction. You you want to frame things properly. Someone wants to go on a casual date. What they're saying is is I want to absolve myself from all responsibility before we even start. And dressing in a certain way says this is not. I am not an emergency exit 
for you to breeze right through on your way out. I'm here to be dealt with, to be reckoned with. I am an entrance, not an exit. That's what dignified closeness says. You have to raise your game to deserve me. Kill a few dragons before you get the hand of this princess. That's what the girl's saying. And the guy is saying is that I, I, don't, I don't want anything that I don't have to kill a few dragons to deserve. If I don't have to kill a dragon to deserve you, then you're not worth, you're not a prize. That's how we, we see the world in the, in, in, in the, in the way, in the, in the light of dreams and greatness. And Amazing. Amazing. Beautiful. Great. Okay, Rav Gav, I'm, I'm going to start with you with the final question. I'll come to you, Rabbi Feldo, and then I'm going to end with you, Rabbi, Rabbi Orlovsky, uh, just as we started back when <laughs> it feels like 10 hours Three or four ago. days ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is a question which sort of like summarizes a lot of what we discussed here. It's a question that a lot of, and you know, a lot of this is questions that like non-Orthodox Jews have looking in, so to speak, into the Orthodox community. This is a question that Orthodox, non-Orthodox Jews, et cetera, have alike. It's a big question of the generation as well. You know, growing up, there are certain idols that you look at, certain people that you aspire to be. We discuss Orthodox Jewry for whatever reason, which we discussed, pulling back on technology, on whatever the world might be doing that isn't within our value system, et cetera. But all this pulling back from a full immersion in modern society is why, is in order to be able to immerse fully in our Torah and our religious life, right? That's, that's presumably why we're doing this. Why is that the real goal of life? Why does pulling away from so, from so much of what God created in the world or gave us the ability to create help us maximize our time and enjoyment on this earth? I.e., if an Orthodox Jew is looking in and he's saying, to himself, why should I be the great rabbi that we discussed, that Rabbi Feldheim discussed about teaching those students, right? Versus a movie actor or, you know, or an all-star basketball player. Why is that the real life? Why should I aspire to be that, Rav Gav? So there's a uh, well-known statement in the Talmud that discusses the concept of if a person uh, in this world doesn't eat an apple, and it's a, it's a mushroom, it doesn't have to only be an apple, but doesn't eat an apple, when he gets upstairs after 120, however long he lives, God's gonna, there's going to be accountability. Why didn't you eat my apple? Meaning to say what? We really are supposed to be involved in enjoying this world. As a matter of fact, one of the commentaries, the name of the Maharal, explains why is it that if you look in the entire written Torah, there is no explicit statement speaking about the next world, because it's about this world. You're supposed to partake. And I think there's been a theme, which we've been playing around also throughout all of us, that yes, there's Torah, there's mitzvahs, there's Hashem, but part and parcel is that, is that God created this world. So then the next question people say, well, God created all the ABC, so why do you stay away from that? The answer is, there are some things God created to partake of, and some things he created not to partake of. And in order for one to really be able to maximize, there has to be choice. And in order to have choice, there have to be those opportunities for challenge to the left and to the right. The ultimate, if I may just rephrase your statement, is not to immerse ourselves in Torah life and whatnot. The ultimate is to connect with the creator of the world and to maximize the greatest levels of a pleasure that we're able to ever accomplish. That, that's the goal. Question is, what's going to get me there? That's the question. So if there's something that's not going to get me there, so I'm going to try to move away from that. And the, 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 the sad reality is I understand it all too well growing up in the modern Orthodox community with, with there was an, I think, an amazing article. I wish I had it still. I'm sure you've seen it with, written by an 11th grader, uh, you know, who was writing about, uh, you know, they tell, it's okay, it'll get sticky, but it's good it's at the end. So I can say like, oh, we're out of time. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. But everybody last you will address it. But about, about a boy saying, and I think personally growing up in the, in the religious world, I didn't learn about the great rabbis. Maybe I did, but they didn't stick out in my mind. I learned about Michael Jordan. I learned a lot about Michael Jordan. I learned about Larry Bird. <laughs> I don't know it's a basketball, whatever. My father's in Boston, forgive me, whatever. You know, I, I learned a lot about music and singers and whatever. I learned a lot more than just the Brady Bunch. I learned a lot of things. And I didn't even have an understanding that I was missing the whole point. I had no understanding until I started getting involved with it. 
it's so much easier to get involved with the quick basketball shot and with the rock concert and with the good food. It's just easy. But for those, for the youngsters of this world, they'll know who I'm even quoting. I won't say his name, but easy come, easy go. You had your eyes wide open. I'm even yoving. But what happens is, I'm assuming you won't know what I'm talking about, Baruch Hashem. But the point is, is that easy come, easy go. Understand the fact is, is that Torah learning and connecting to the ultimate is a challenge. It takes time and effort. But the value, you can't compare. It's the purpose of creation. So we try to stay away from the things that are going to take us away from the greatest opportunities that we've ever had. And like we've echoing sessions one and two, and now we're into three, is that the greatest pleasure that one can experience in this world is connecting with the ultimate, with the almighty, and with truth itself. Rabbi Feldheim, our, it, it is, the, is the entire concept, mean, meaning I just want to twist this a little bit for you, meaning people looking outside in are saying, Wow, you pulled back from all of that stuff, right? So that you could be a tremendous Torah scholar. Not seeing it, is it all a fake out, you know? Or is, 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 that, is that the ultimate? Let me, let, me, let, let me say it like this. This is probably a good way to what I think is my most important message to the world. If I had one, you allowed me one minute to say thing, what I would say is that people think that people who are doing things wrong they're driven by desire, lust. In Hebrew, we call it tava. That, and that's the root of evil. The evil inclination is desire. I want to turn it on its head. It's exactly the opposite. Desire is the good inclination. Desire is the holiest thing in the world. There's a beautiful world. The only thing you have going for you is desire. When you see someone doing something wrong, you know what happens to them? They don't have desires. What happens is they lost their desire. Somebody beat them. My line to a boy who was, who was, who was hanging out and just, just, just random girlfriends or whatever it is, is I don't say to him as, you have too many types, too many desires. It's exactly the opposite. It's never, what happened to you? Who, who broke you? Who robbed you? You used to be a dreamer. Why are you settling for this? completion is to be fully dreaming all failures all what we call sin is just another word for having your dreams squeezed out of you and settling for crumbs when you wanted the loaf so what is the loaf so we we encourage basketball for a young kid maybe not boston basketball but but we but not the Knicks either, unfortunately. We got the eighth pick, whatever. It's not for the crowd here, but crazy. But but whatever it is, it's, we encourage. Why? Because at, at, for a kid, basketball is desire. It's about being. But what's supposed to happen is, like I said, like Rob Gav said, is that eventually it gets old. It's like, okay, now I have muscles. I can jump. Then you need something bigger you need to be creative you buy a guitar you make music and then you, you have all these you can do a kumzit you can sing songs you feel deep but then you realize that it's a little hazy i want to understand things you know you're literally describing my life <laughs> Very good. Very good. so i actually made this up following you i learned this whole thing from your life okay god okay god is the guy i call when i get hard questions <laughs> yeah right <laughs> And so, so what happens is, is, is that then, so you, you play basketball, now you got your guitar, now you realize you want to understand things, you start to read a science book, and you get into electricity, and, and I was the motors, and, and all these things, and electromagnets, and, you, and then you realize that that's nice, but there's biology, and there's this, and then you realize that there's physics, and then there's English, and there's writing, and there's poetry, eventually, you know what, you know where you get in the end, you go, is there any system that defines it all? Your desire will take you in the end to the place where you want the bird's eye view of all of reality, reality intellectual. And that's what the Torah is. Desire to know Torah. It is, it, it is the bird's eye view of the world. It's not the discounting of all the other fields. Torah is to, to the universe what the conductor is to all the instruments in the symphony. In earlier stages of life, you can start off in the audience and then you can start playing an instrument. And then when you get to the end, you realize the only place to be is to be is, is to is, is to embrace it all. And that's what drives us to Torah. And that only happens if you don't get derailed on the way by someone squashing your desire out of you. 
If we leave our kids with desire, they will all end up at that same place to be the conductor of the greatest philharmonic playing the music, the greatest composer. And that's, but unfortunately, what we discussed in all the previous questions holds true, is that the world squeezes the dreams out of us and we end up with, with stuck in the basketball of the music or even worse things, wishing that we were so innocent playing basketball. There's far lower things than playing basketball. And that's why we're preserving our kids. We, we, we fight to preserve their dreams because dreams lead you to Torah. All right. Rabbi Olavsky, your thank you, Rabbi Feldman. Rabbi Olavsky, your final thoughts on, on this of why is the, this the real goal in life to sort of pull back for the sake of reaching higher and, and again, with, you know, searching for greatness in terms of being a great rabbi versus a big movie actor. Why is that, why is that our preference in our world? It's not. We, our goal isn't to become a rabbi. Our goal is to embrace a spiritual life because it's so much more fulfilling. So you eat pizza. How much pizza can you eat? And after a while, you just feel sick. So you play tennis, and after a while, you get tennis elbow, and uh, you, you feel sick. And yet, but spirituality that can lift you out of this world into a spiritual pleasure that gets better and better and better and better, and it just, it's endless. And the reason people don't understand this is because there are very few talented Gemara teachers in the world. Very few. But if you've ever had the schus to learn by one, when you go to somebody like this, there is nothing more exciting. Rev. Uh, Aaron Cutler, when he was raising the money to start the Lakewood Yeshiva, so uh, he had this one uh, fellow who was helping him go around and raise money. So they come home at night, and he sits down in a chair with a newspaper. So if Aaron looks at him, he says, why don't you open up a Gemara? He says, don't worry, Rabbi, I'm helping you. I have my world to come. So I'm not talking about the world to come. I'm talking about this world. A person, a person who, who understands the pleasure of learning Torah, there is nothing more exciting than it. I give, a, I give an online daf yomi shir. And I had a high school kid who joined in, you know, and he, he he, I, I had to tell him at one point, I said, listen, eventually you're going to have to go back to school. It's not going to be this much fun, you know, unfortunately. But a person should be able to learn Gemara. And it's like, you know, when, when I would sit in the shir from Moshe Shapiro, we would come out dancing. We wanted to make a bracha. Bless you, God, who gave us the Torah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. And so you have these people who sit there, uh, you know, and they and they game and they play games and they and they play video and they and they and they go here and they eat and they then yeah. But a person who's had an experience where you've been lifted up out of this world, so most people never had that because they don't even know that that's the goal of Judaism. But that's what it is. And I've had secular people tell me, Rabbi, if you could show me how to have a spiritual experience, I agree with you. It's better than everything else in this world. So that's all of Judaism. All of Judaism is, yeah, as the Masil Susharim says, why are we in this world to get the greatest possible pleasure, which is the spiritual pleasure from being close to God. That's it. We're not here to, you know, to eat, to drink, to, to go swimming, to, you know. Otherwise, what do, you need a, what do you need a soul for? That soul gives you that existentialistic angst that I want more out of life. You should have a cow soul. Be the cow man. Boom, 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 boom. And all of life should be one long conga line. Dun, 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 right? Douglas Adams, you know, he in one of his Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy books, he had this, the, the party, the party that never ends. There's this spaceship, you know, and it flies around and it's just a party. Every now and then they land on a planet, you know, and they steal all the uh or the avocado to make more guacamole mix, and they go back up, and then and, 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 and the party just goes on forever. Yeah, but we're not animals. We're here to be able to have this unbelievable spiritual pleasure that takes us out of this world. And when a person comes out of a sheer like that, or a class like that, or a talk like that, and you're lifted up, it's just the best. I feel I feel that way right now. As you should. 
Because <laughs> I, in my spare time, listen to myself, my own recordings. <laughs> I always walk away entertained and, and uplifted and inspired. And I always and there, are, ve- and there are very few, and there are very few good, good Talmud teachers out there. Yeah, and, anyway. I, and, I, and, I, and I always walk away um, with a new idea because I can't remember anything I ever said. <laughs> and so I'm listening to myself talk and I hear myself asking a question. I'm like, that's a great question. Oh, I don't know what the answer is. Then I hear my answer. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's brilliant. <laughs> I, there, was, there was an old Yiddish play where a guy says, right, how did Noah build the Teva, build the Ark, if Noah was blind? Oh, that's yeah. a great question. The answer was he wasn't blind. That's a great answer. You know? <laughs> Rabbis, Rabbi Olasky, Rav Gav, Rabbi Feldheim, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it once again getting together for real power learning and to be able to pass on these ideas to our watchers, our listeners. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to doing this again. Bum, 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 next planet. <laughs> <laughs>